today, I would like to discuss a Nickelodeon show that few people talk highly of nowadays. This is a series that ran for 100 segments, won five Emmy Awards, and broke new boundaries for CGI animation on television. It's called Fanboy and Chum Chum. Here's why I think it's worth remembering. Nick, 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 the Nick, 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 Nick Tando. Fanboy and Chum Chum was the brainchild of Eric Robles, whose previous animation work had been as a character designer on Nickelodeon shows like The X's and Ni Hao Kai Land. When approached by Fred Seibert of Frederator Studios to pitch a show for Nick's new Random Cartoons Animation Showcase, Robles took influence from his childhood memories of hanging out at convenience stores and playing arcade games to create Fanboy. The pilot followed the sugar-fueled slapstick adventures of two young superhero obsessives, as they accidentally create an ice monster supervillain and fight him with a thumb war. Of the 39 shorts created for random cartoons, not only was Fanboy the only one to be animated in full CGI, but not a lot changed from the pilot to the final show. But I think those two factors gave it the edge over all the other random cartoon shorts, and that includes the fan favorite pilot from The Batch, Adventure Time. For years, people have wondered why Nickelodeon turned down what would go on to be one of the most successful shows from the past decade. But I think their decision makes sense when you look at it from the view of an executive. Like, Adventure Time's pilot is really fun, but it doesn't feel like a fully realized series. And it would, and did, need to go through a lot of development. But with Fanboy, the pieces were all there to begin with. So with that, let's see how it fared as a full 11 minute series. For the first 10 episodes or so, I wasn't the biggest fan of Fanboy and Chum Chum. I can tell that the show was searching for its identity. There's characters like Yo and Lupe who would gain less prominence as the show went on, but here they try to give them different dynamics with the boys and character traits that didn't stick for too long. An abundance of fart jokes can be found in these early episodes, but they were slowly phased out over time. I also got kind of a Spongebob vibe with the loads of stories that could be summed up as character X annoys character Y. These observations could also point to some executive meddling to make this appeal to a wider range of audiences. But whatever was the case, I began to change my tune when episodes like Night Morning and Total Recall rolled around. These episodes both had a great sense of childlike excitement about staying up too late or playing with a new toy, and they both took their premises into funny and bizarre directions. Behold the Hall of Recall! Alright, next to her is a vintage fire truck. Self-explanatory. And this is an exact replica of the battleship Potomkins, complete with 18 functioning nuclear warheads. Why was that recalled? Choking hazard. Fanboy and Chum Chum leave a lot to be desired as protagonists, as I typically can't tell them apart in their personalities, and they're kind of written to fit whatever plot they're thrown into. However, the side characters are fun because of how diverse they are. On one end, you have Mr. Mufflin, the grouchy school teacher whose deadpan confusion and random bouts of excitement lead to some unpredictable highlights. That's why I can only drive to and from school. But on the other end of the spectrum is this load of unexpected pop culture parodies. Some of these annoyed me at first, like Janitor Poopatine. He seemed like an excuse to make simple Star Wars references. Like this one. Oh, I think you'll find the hand air dryer is fully operational. And this one. I think you'll find the water fountain is fully operational. Don't forget about this original one. I think you'll find my tropical island is fully vacational. But I grew to like him and many others over time, and I saw them as more than just one note references. Like, Poopatine ended up being great whenever he was just randomly inserted into an episode where he didn't belong. You also got Kyle the Conjurer, a vague Harry Potter parody acting as fanboy and Chum Chum's classmate and constant punching bag. A lot of his episodes have very similar structures, but I feel that his magic helped to bring in some cool conflicts, like the wizard version of a tooth fairy, who is just this intense barbarian. Manarctica is Superman frozen by Mr. Freeze with an Adam West inspired voice, and whenever he appears, he's never in the same role twice. Sometimes he's a merchandise mascot, sometimes he's Santa Claus, and sometimes he's threatening to murder a child because he won't stop crying. Cats and children crying! That's the only reason I give them all presents. I'd like to give them another, but I don't have any extras. Oh well, uh, I'll just have to destroy him instead. You never know what flavor of him you'll get, 
and for our character who surrounds the lives of our protagonists, that's pretty cool. I can't forget to mention Boog, the local Chad who spends time slacking off at his job, showing intense care for his car and a Donkey Kong ripoff machine, and physically abusing children in a pastime he refers to as bopping. If this image of him in a parody for the poster of A Clockwork Orange, complete with this fantastic pun, A Botwork Orange, isn't enough to make you fall in love with this sausage-shaped hunk, maybe his John Travolta-inspired voice will. Oops! Did I write lollipops? Cause today's special is free lollipops! <laughs> That's such a random element of his character, but it helps make him so oddly charming. Speaking of voices, the cast for this show is really odd, and I like that about it. You have voice acting mainstays like Nika Flutterman and Jeff Bennett, but then you have the actor who voices Lenny, and he looks like this. While a lot of the characters yell quite often, or have voices that aren't the easiest on the ears, I have to give the casting a lot of credit. Getting the man who plays a crack addict on a downward spiral on It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia to play fanboy was a stroke of pure genius. You guys, you gotta make it sexy. Hips and nips, otherwise I'm not eating. Another positive to this simple cast is that they can plausibly stretch what is considered to be in character. Take the episode hypno -taz, where the mother of Oz, this comic book guy slash cool brother figure to the boys, hypnotizes her son into selling off his highly regarded collection. Now Oz's mom has never acted this crazy in any other episode, but in her tiny list of previous appearances, she was just a looming threat, with the voice of George Costanza's mom from Seinfeld. So who says that she can't suddenly have a complicated and villainous plan? A great Inception slash Matrix parody comes with it, so at the end of the day, I think this weird mishmash of a supporting cast is great, especially in episodes where they're all gathered together. Those ended up being some of my personal favorites. Is Kyle riding a falcon? Or maybe there is. Every episode of Fanboy and Chum Chum is about something different. Sometimes there can be a unique tribute to Nickelodeon's history, complete with a live action sequence and cameos from animation studio greeter Don Newhouse, and other times it has a musical tribute to a single line from the Arnold Schwarzenegger classic Jingle All the Way. Put that, put that cookie, put that cookie, put that, put that cookie, put that cookie down! The price to pay for this delicious variety of premises is a frequently scatterbrained plot structure. Above all else, this show tries to make you laugh and surprise you, but I hope you like gags that constantly abide by the rule of threes, and twists that are either obviously implied or completely come out of nowhere, because that is a huge chunk of this show. There isn't much continuity or serious backstory, so don't expect to ever learn why Fanboy and Chum Chum are living on their own in a water tower. Comedy is always the focus, and to a nearly frustrating degree, enough to the point where the name of the setting is built off a Star Wars reference. Since the dawn of my career, I have vowed to destroy gum in every corner of the galaxy. District. Whenever Fanboy or Chum Chum mentions something that another character doesn't believe is real, you can guarantee that they will be in the climax of the episode, and they never subvert from that trope. Other times it's just, hey, here's a random reference to Tron. Everyone remembers the movie Tron, right? No. 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 Yes. I, um, I mean, no. No. This kind of randomness can lead to some unorthodox comedic moments, but it more often than not fails when it's built into the premise or structure of an episode. There's stories about Fanboy discovering that he has a second arm, or the boys just not recognizing Manarctica for no real reason. In these examples, little is done to justify building an entire episode off of these odd ideas, and the results tend to leave a bad taste in my mouth. So much of this show is predictable in its attempts to be unpredictable, but some episodes that escalate their ideas are able to avoid the traps that plots usually fall into. Van vs. Wild is a fun episode where we see a simple climb up the roof of the Frosty Mart be warped into a mountain expedition through the imagination of the boys. The way that the characters are able to find their way back down to safety is quite convoluted, but it's great for how much it revels in its convolutedness. If I can get just the right angle, the sun will cut through this sign and we can use it to get down. Great idea. Except you need the sun for that, you idiot! Or maybe you don't. Even if I found its style to be flawed, Fanboy and Chum Chum always stuck by it, and I know that I'll remember the great bits that came from it much more than the annoying ones. To many, the most memorable part of this series is its art and animation. 
its bug-eyed and overbite written character designs are somewhat infamous nowadays, but in all honesty, I kind of like the way that it looks, and for its time, it was somewhat revolutionary. Of the big three cable networks, Nickelodeon is the only one to have really dipped their toe into making their own CGI animated programming, and the results have been mixed. If you compare Fanboy to the two shows that premiered in the years right before and after it, you'll see that the characters were often stiffly animated or had an ugly uncanniness to them. Now I wouldn't want Back at the Barnyard or Planet Sheen to look any other way, but they did show a tiny bit of room for improvement. Not only was Fanboy and Chum Chum their first CGI show not based on a movie or game, but it actually tried to capture the look and feel of 2D squash and stretch animation in full 3D. This was before the days of Hotel Transylvania and the Peanuts movie that did similar things on a film budget. So it was kind of unique to have animation that paid tribute to the past rather than try to carve a new path. It is far from perfect though, as so many expressions in the early episodes look very off from how they probably should be. As it went on, they really made the facial expressions gel with the models, especially with the way that the eyes bulged out. When the show really takes advantage of being in CGI, there can be some cool camera shots, particularly whenever they take a stab at acting set pieces. One of my favorite pieces of animation from this show is this 5 second long clip from the beginning of the episode Refill Madness, where Boog drives his car to work. It goes by so quickly and makes little sense, but it is such a visually striking moment, and I found myself constantly going back to it. Fanboy and Chum Chum did have to make some sacrifices in its art design. This is a trade-off CGI shows often have to face with how tight their budgets can be, so much so that Sonic Boom even had a gag about it. Just think of all the hundreds more stories to be told using the same eight characters and four locations. The possibilities are limitless. The series was confined to telling its stories in only a handful of locations, and reused assets to the point where it got distracting. Like these creepy green beetles from one episode were supposed to be lice in another. I see pretty much no similarities between these two images. However, I think the series may do with its restrictions when it came to the lighting. While hair and some specific details look rather muddy, the characters themselves are covered in shiny textures. And when paired with how a lot of them share the same body types and proportions, it looks like a bunch of action figures in play sets. And that aesthetic works really well with the themes of the show. There was actually a brief line of Fanboy and Chum Chum toys made by Jazzwares in 2012, and I never had the pleasure of owning any part of it. Though if I ever feel the need to drop 30 bucks on a bug figure, I'll let you guys know. Throughout the show, you'll also find little bits of 2D artwork. Every piece of art for the series was done in 2D before it was modeled. I believe that this is kind of common practice for most CGI productions, but it's interesting to see that in some ways, I think it looks far more expressive and appealing in this dimension. This look is mainly retained in the title cards for each episode, and I adore how wacky and twisted the characters appear in these. I wouldn't mind if the show looked like this, but I'm glad that it went with the CGI style that it had. I kind of think of the animation as being the modern day equivalent to season 1 of The Simpsons. It's a little crude and basic today, and truly isn't for everyone, but it's got a unique direction and a lot of effort poured into it. But despite debuting the high ratings and looking like nothing else on TV at the time, Fanboy and Chum Chum only lasted two seasons of 26 episodes. This was, and sadly continues to be, common practice for Nicktoons, as I believe only six series from the last 10 years have gone on to have three seasons or more. This is quite disappointing considering that there were signs of the series hitting its stride, with episodes that had some super creative premises and humor, but most of these were burned off on weekdays at 7am. They hyped this up as a huge event, even though they were airing the episodes in the cheapest way that they possibly could. I feel like a season 3 could have been a strong improvement, and perhaps could have won over some skeptical viewers. You know, if the Justin Bieber references didn't already get you on board. Bieber, Bieber, Bieber! There were a few things that were teased, but never saw a payoff, like the elusive King Frostius, what the boys looked like unmasked, and a resolution to all the sexual tension between Lenny and Bug. Come on, something was clearly between them. I, I need to say some goodbyes, all right? Oh, good. Oh, I'm touched, Bug. I've grown fond of you. Oh. Out of my way! 
but for what it's worth, I enjoyed what ended up being the final episode they produced, Super Chums, which showed the characters reimagined as superheroes and villains teaming up to become best friends. Not only was it a follow-up to one of the best episodes from season two, but thematically, it felt like a fine note to end the series on, showing the superhero geeks becoming real superheroes. Hey, where'd Copy Kitten go? You threw her into the far reaches of space. I did? Eh, I'm sure she'll land on her feet. Ow, my feet! Nowadays, fanboy Chum Chum is rarely, if ever, mentioned online. I see clips from the Mighty Bee or Angry Beavers being thrown around on Twitter all the time, but I see almost none from this show. Hilarious moments from this series do actually exist, and in some ways, it was truly ahead of its time. That is the shape of the world! I do really feel that the series is worth remembering, even if it's far from perfect. It's got a fun and silly style that occasionally may get repetitive, but it's taken far enough that it becomes its own thing. I don't think of it even remotely as fondly as I did when I was in its target demographic, but watching it now, it did really grow on me over time, and its stranger elements caught me off guard. Why didn't I think of it before? I can use my wand to save us. Kyle! You can do magic! If it came out at a time when not every other cartoon was trying to be the next Spongebob, people might have given it more of a chance. If you go back and look at the posts on Frederator's blog from when Fanboy was being produced, you can see how passionate so much of the staff was about the show. You can also find this image, and I don't know what it means, but I know that it's going to haunt my dreams. The level of talent involved with it can be seen in all the great things that much of the crew moved on to. Take the composer Brad Breek, for instance. Sure, he composed the iconic theme song that I feel shame about knowing all the lyrics to, and the title card music, which was usually just the name of an episode being repeated, but he also composed the whole soundtrack to Gravity Falls, so all my complaints are null and void. I'm also very excited about the new project Eric Robles is working on for Nickelodeon, Glitch Tax. I'm already sold based on the glimpses of it that I've seen, and I hope that everyone gives this a fair shot including Nickelodeon themselves. I'm not going to act like fanboy and Chum Chum not getting the respect it deserved was some sort of great injustice, because while I do think you should check it out, if you avoided it the first time around, it's nothing worth getting upset over. But if anyone even thinks about disrespecting my man, Lenny Flynn Boyle, you got another thing coming. Professional swimsuit model. <laughs> oh. I can already feel the sand getting into my belly button. 